Okay, so uh, this topic is going to be called pathfinding, and we're going to discuss what that actually means first of all before we get into too much detail. Uh, this is a fairly uh, detailed, challenging topic, so uh, brace yourself, uh, pull up some popcorn, and uh, hopefully we get through this fine. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. So, uh, what we're going to deal with is first what it is, how it's used, and where we see it. Uh, pathfinding is just a very simple concept that says get from point A to point B. Now looking on my screen here, let me, where's my pencil? If I have point A here, this is my starting point. You know what, let's call this, um, hold on a second. Let's call this our start and down here let's call this our end. So what this usually means is that we have some uh, element that wants to get from the beginning, the start, to the end. So maybe this you might see this in a video game where you have AI chasing down people um, for various reasons. It could be zombies, it could be a first person shooter, it could be something as simple as a Goomba uh, in Mario Brothers. Now we see this in almost every type of video game and every game approaches it a little bit differently. Some games are three dimensional, some games are two dimensional, some games you're looking at it from a top down perspective like we see here. Some games you're looking at it from an over the shoulder perspective. It, it doesn't really matter. The, the point is, is that the world exists in some space, two, 2D space or 3D space, and some element of the world wants to get from one point to another point for some reason. Maybe that's something as simple as they saw the player, so they're running at the player. Or it might be something like the player knocked over a vase or something and made a sound. So the zombie starts to investigate and go towards where that sound was, even though the player's not there anymore. It doesn't really make a difference. The point is, again, that something wants to get from one location to another location. Now this can be done in a very static way so it hears a sound and it goes towards the sound until it gets there then d does some other action afterwards or it could be in a dynamic way where let's say for example we have a bunch of elements chasing a player so let's say um, the players in the middle of a world there's walls around there's like a maze or something along those lines and we have all these enemies chasing the player throughout this world each one of those players has to figure out what the best way is to get to the player or each one of those sorry enemies is trying to find the best way to get to the player now each one is gonna have a different strategy because they're at a different location there might be obstacles in the way or in this case that we see here there's no obstacles so if we were to think in real life if we were at the start and we wanted to get to the end we would just say draw a straight line go straight along that path in gaming worlds we can't always do that um, it's not necessarily a straight line. In gaming worlds, it's more thinking of, well, let's break the world down into a grid. And let's always move from the center of one grid coordinate to the center of the next grid coordinate. Remember, the computer is not that bright. We have to give it specific instructions. Now, this is fine, like moving from A to B when there's no obstacles. Yeah, you probably could just uh, go right from the S location to the E location just by calculating the angle to move on and run along that angle and that's not a problem where the problem arises is when you have an obstacle in the way and you can't just run straight through like I said normally we would just go straight through get them now in the gaming world we have to worry about these grid coordinates and let me just bring something over here if I have something like this all of a sudden there's a wall in the way and now our starting location that wants to get to our ending location can't run in a straight line anymore. It's just not possible. How does it get there? Well, it's got to figure out the best path to get around this wall and get to the end point. How does it do that? Well, there's a lot of different options. Now, let's assume that the, that the chaser always needs to stay in the center of each uh, square. Let's call them tiles for now. So the chaser always needs to stay in the center of each square. Now, think about all the different possibilities. It doesn't have to be a straight line. It could be something ridiculous like that. Obviously, that is not the best path to go in, but it is a path. Maybe your AI is not that bright. Who knows? Or maybe they want to go a nice straight line. They come across, they come up. Maybe they only work in horizontal and vertical movements. That's fine. 
But maybe, so I guess that first movement was diagonal, so it would have been something like this, maybe something like that. And that's fine. See how many nodes it crosses. It goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 full movements to get to that end point. But what if we have the ability to travel on diagonals? Now we can go up across here, up here, diagonal, 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 straight down. And let's see how that shrunk it down. Now we have it one diagonal, up one, one diagonal, so that's two diagonals, three diagonals, four diagonals, and then another vertical, two verticals, three verticals, and four verticals. So four verticals and three diagonals. Now why do we care whether it's horizontal, vertical, or diagonal? Well, let's think of Pythagorean theorem, for example. If I have a triangle moving along a horizontal, if this cost me one unit, if this is if this is one unit large, and this is one unit large, well the hypotenuse of any right angle triangle is always the longest side. And if you do your math, a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, so a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. That means that our c over here, our diagonal, actually has a different cost than the horizontal and vertical. And in fact it's bigger. Let's look at this. If a is 1, 1 squared, plus b, which is 1, 1 squared, is equal to c squared, then what we have is 2 is equal to c squared, or c is equal to root 2, which is about 1.4. Well, that's actually a difference. So if we think about this cost, we think about this cost for a second, and we have 1.4 for each diagonal. Let's count the number of diagonals we got. Diagonals. And the number of horizontal or verticals. Now those ones all have the same cost as we see here in our triangle. So let's say each diagonal has a cost of uh, 1.4. You know what? Let's make that math nice and simple. Let's multiply everything by 10 so we don't have to deal with decimals. So let's say each diagonal costs 14. And if that means, if each diagonal is 14, that means each horizontal and vertical is 10. So let's look at these costs now. How many diagonals do we have in this one? And how many horizontal verticals do we have? Here we have one diagonal, two diagonals, three diagonals, four diagonals. So four diagonals times 14, that gives us 40, that gives us 56. How many horizontal and verticals? Well, we got one, two, three, four four horizontal verticals at a cost of 10, that's 40. So there we have a total of 96. Well, let's look at that original one that we did. We went up, we went across, and we went down. And let's think about this. We went up one, two, three, across, four, five, six, seven, down, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So that had a cost of 12, oops, times 10, which gives us 120. So what we can see here is that by adding the ability to go in a diagonal distance actually decreased the cost. The cost being the amount of distance traveled. Now that makes a difference. Let's try something else. We went up this path here. What happens if we decided to go down first? So let's say we went down, or sorry, diagonal, down, 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 diagonal, diagonal, diagonal. So let's look at this. We have one diagonal, two diagonals, three, four diagonals. So this one has four, let's do this up here so we can see this, four diagonals at a cost of 14, gives us again 56. How many horizontal verticals? We got one, two. That's it. Just two. So that's two times 10, oops, times 10, that's 20. That means that one only has a cost of 76. Huh. Well, we actually just found a better path. Well, that's what our pathfinding algorithm is going to do. It's going to look at all the possible paths and say, well, which one's the best one? In this case, we see that the last one that we tested here is actually the best path. And this is not the only thing that's going to happen. We're going to be looking at other scenarios. Let's look at a third scenario. Looking at this scenario over here, a bad 
path a, a bad passing algorithm is going to look at this and say oh look i want to go straight towards that enemy it's going to say i'm going to go all the way over here oh i hit a wall i got to go back around and that is a terrible pathing algorithm but some pathing algorithms will make mistakes and this will occur we don't actually want that to happen our pathing algorithm needs to realize that hey you know what going straight towards the enemy is not always the best choice we gotta think long term we gotta think well with every movement which movement is the best movement thinking one step at a time we're gonna realize we're gonna go here and then 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 the diagonal and we're gonna go across do, 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 straight through and obviously that is a much cheaper cost than going oh no and coming back around back and back through again so we have to think about this why do I mention this because then we can incorporate worlds with different terrain types over here I've created a very simple world which has walls in red it's got mud in a dark brown it's got a road in gray and it's got water in light blue and of course our ending and our start so let's put our start and our end over here again if this is water this is a road over here we have mud and we have our wall now let's think about this logically in our game oh, I should probably write wall because we already have a W on the other side let's think about this water is that impossible to move through no not really but it is more costly it takes me more time to move through water what about a road well a road is in fact faster how much faster well that's up to me to decide as the game designer but it should be faster than your standard terrain think about this for a second if you're running across um, a big grass field that's gonna be a lot slower than if you're sprinting down a road mud well we see over here we got mud well that's just another deterrent not necessarily a complete obstacle yeah you can go through the mud it's probably gonna be pretty slow though but how much slower that's where you have to decide well how much of an impact is each terrain type gonna have on my choices so for example if I were to go across from the starting position and decide you know what I'm gonna go across I'm gonna cross I'm gonna swim across this water and then I'm gonna go up on a diagonal let's say up on a diagonal up on a diagonal up on a diagonal up up on a diagonal across down on a diagonal down down that is a perfectly valid path it means I'm swimming across the water now the question is how much time is swimming across the water gonna cost me is it worth it for our player to go down across on the road and then up on the diagonal boom 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 and then follow the same path well what is more expensive is it more expensive to cross this one tile of water versus these one two three four five six to get across to the same point well that depends on the cost of swimming across water how do we decide on this well, we get to decide that as game designers so for example let's say our standard tan tile here costs us 10 for our horizontal and 14 for our diagonal right so let's do a tan uh, let me just actually erase that I don't like that let's, let's say we have our our standard empty tile where's my marker let's say we have our standard empty tile and that costs us for our horizontal vertical 10 and for our diagonal 14 maybe for water I get to decide something else maybe I say you know what water is pretty expensive so maybe it's five times more expensive so that means that I'm gonna say five times more expensive and maybe that maybe it's five times again over here so that means that it's actually gonna cost me 50 to move horizontally and vertically across water and actually uh, 50 70 to move one diagonal well that actually makes a difference now let's talk about mud maybe mud cost eight times because it's slower to move across mud than it is to swim I would assume I guess it depends on how thick the mud is and how deep it is though 
Now, let's say, for example, uh, a road. Now, a road I should be moving faster on. So instead of a multiplier bigger, maybe the multiplier is a fraction, 0 0.5 times. So maybe I move twice as fast on the road than I do on uh, the standard ground, empty ground. And then, of course, you have your wall. Now, your wall should be completely impassable. So if you give it something ludicrous, like, I don't know, maybe like 10,000 times, then it'll never ever choose that as an option. So what we've done is we've set up a scaling system that says, you know what, depending on the type of terrain, it may not be the best choice to go across that terrain. So I have to reevaluate this. Again, this is what our pathfinding is doing. It's looking at these collections, it's looking at these options of which path to take and say, well, which one is the best one at every given step? How are we going to do this? So what we're going to have to do to actually solve this problem is something called dynamic programming. And dynamic programming is a very interesting concept. Basically what it is, is we build upon previous solutions to find our final solution. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, if I know how much it costs to get from the start to one square, and I want to go to another square from that square, I use the cost to get to the previous square and add that to my next cost. And then I do the same thing from that square. I say, well, what is the previous cost to get here? And then add that to the next cost to get to my next square. So we do it in a stepwise fashion. So let me just kind of move a couple of these out of the way so we can look at this and get a finer breakdown. So looking at our most basic version over here, what I want you to imagine is a couple buckets. So let's say we have bucket one, let's call this the open bucket. I'll get into why we call that the open bucket in just a second. That should be an N. Open bucket. And then maybe down here we have our closed bucket. So our open bucket, what it's going to do is it's going to hold all of the possible uh, tiles that we want to check. Now, in our world of pathfinding, we have a special name for each one of these tiles. We call them nodes. Now, if you've done any of the other tutorials or training, you've probably come across the term node a few times, especially in things like particle systems and stuff like that. Now, so each one of these tiles, we're going to interchange between the word tile and node. Node is a much more general term. So basically, if we're starting at the start point, we're going to say, all right, let's add that to our potential path nodes. Well, of course it's going to be in the path. It better be in the path. It's where we're starting from. But we're going to add it to our potential pathing nodes, our, our potential open nodes. So we're going to add this one. Now, I don't really have any type of uh, structure, but typically, oops, typically the way we do this is we add a um, a grid coordinate by row and column. So if our our rows and columns are numbered zero through, in this case, zero through nineteen and zero through twelve, then wherever this one is, I would add that coordinate into my open section. So let's see, zero one two. Oh, sorry, we go row then column. Zero one two three four. So that's row four and column 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and column 10. So we're going to add that to our open set. And what that is is saying this is a possible path point. Anything in the open bucket is a possible, possible path point. So our starting node is going to be our only one we have in there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go through a looping process. And this looping process is going to continue until one of two things happen. We either find a path or we don't find a path. We know we found a path if we ever add our ending point. In this case, that one is going to be, uh, let's see, that's going to be uh, row 6, column 11, 12, 13, 14, 14. If this point is ever added to the closed section, we're done. We have found a path. However, if at any point we ever have an empty, open list, then we've lost it. We don't have a possible path. How would that possibly happen? Well, imagine, for example, 
Where's my pen here? Imagine, for example, we had a wall that was built completely around that. You can't get out of there. There's no path possible. Or a wall built around the other one. Or maybe there's just some obstacle that's impassable. It does happen. So that's when we stop looping. We're going to continue this loop, and it's going to follow the same iterative steps. You might think, well, what are these steps? Well, I've written them out for you so we can see these. Let me just pull this up. Do, 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 do. There it is. So what we do is we're going to be calculating costs. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding and removing things from our open and closed um, buckets. Let's go back for a second and what I mean by this. So we're going to add this to the open bucket. And then the first thing we're going to do is, well, we're going to start that looping process that says, find the element in the open bucket with the cheapest cost to get to the end point. Now this cost is made up of two things. This is called our F cost. And this is the cost, the approximate, approximate cost to get to to get to the end. Well, what is it made up of? Well, it's made up of two other costs. It's made up of G, which is the cost from S, the start, to the node we're talking about, the node in question. And then we have our H cost. Now this is an interesting one. Now this one's going to take me a minute to explain. Our H cost is something called a heuristic. And what a heuristic is, is think of it more like an educated guess. It's, um, it's an approximation almost. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose a heuristic. It's not an algorithm, it's a heuristic. And we're going to choose a strategy that says, well, what is a good approximation to get from our node in question to the endpoint? Something that we can calculate really, really quickly. So let's say, for example, we're talking about the start node. Well, what is the obvious, easiest way to calculate to get there? Well, we do what's called the Manhattan heuristic. Manhattan. Oops. Manhattan. The Manhattan heuristic is called the Manhattan heuristic because it's like moving on the streets of Manhattan. The streets of Manhattan are one of the most well-designed uh, urban planning setups there is in the world. Everything runs in perfectly up and down or left and right, so north and south or east and west, and everything is in a perfect grid fashion. So you have your avenues and you have your streets, and they have something like, I don't remember, uh, it's like First Avenue to, you know, 72nd Avenue and First Street to 96th Street or something like that. And you always have intersections. So imagine how that works. If it, they only run horizontal and vertical, our Manhattan heuristic is going to follow this path. It's going to say, well, if the node in question, what is the cost to get from the node in question to the end point? Well, in this case, Manhattan would say go all the way to the right and go down. Okay? No diagonals whatsoever. The Manhattan one says, stay on the streets. You can't cross through the buildings. This is what our heuristic is. So it is the cost, so uh, approximate cost from the node to the end. So G is from the start to the node, and the H is from the node to the end. And our F is just the combined, the sum of these. F is equal to G plus H. That's it. Now, how do we actually calculate this? Well, G, as I said, this is our dynamic programming. This is, well, what was the cost to get from uh, the start to the previous node, and then from the previous node to the current node? Add those together, that's your G cost. H is we just add up the horizontal and vertical costs to get from our current node to the endpoint. So let's do this one at a time. So the, the process says, well, what is the current? Uh, find the open uh, find the open node, the element in the, the sorry, find the element in the open list 
that has the best F cost. Well, the best cost is the cheapest cost, so lowest F cost. Now, I know from looking at this that the open node, the only one in the open list, is the, is the starting node. So it's not really much of a choice, but we still want to follow the same process. Now, if we go back to the uh, template I was showing you, the first step we're going to do in our eight steps to finding the shortest path is we're going to set our G and our F of our start point to zero. Why? Because it doesn't cost anything to get from start to start. All right. So we're just going to throw them inside of the um, of the open bucket. Now we can recalculate F. That's a bit of a typo. F is not zero because H would not be zero. H would be the cost from here across and down. I'll fix that before I submit the code to you guys. But in any case. Um, this would be a cost of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it would be a cost of 60 using our 10 and 14 uh, cost scenario. So that value of F is the smallest value of F out of all the elements, out of all the nodes in the open list. So we're going to choose that one. So that says choose that one and then remove it from the open list. So we're going to take it out of the open list. And we are going to add it to the close list. So we're going to add it down here. Now when we add an element to the close list, the next part is what really, really matters. We have to continue. We have to uh, create a process that's going to work towards our end goal. So what we do now is we take, um, let me just switch my colors here for a second. Let's do, oh, I don't know. Um, let's do okay, green, I guess. That should probably show up. No, it won't show up. Yellow. Mm, pink will do it. There we go. Okay. Ah, back in there. Okay. So, why did I want to switch my colors up? Because we're going to have to do something. So, once we've taken our node, our node with the smallest F cost, out of the open list, we're going to add it to the close list. And when we add it to the close list, we're going to look at all of its um, adjacent nodes, all of the ones that are around it. So here, 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 and here. Pink is not showing up the way I'd like it. So let me just go back and redo these in white. So we've got to look at all the eight possible nodes around it. Now, do we actually have to look at all eight? Well, that depends on the current node itself. Um, sorry, sorry, I should mention, when we add an element to the closed list, we're going to consider that our current node or current node, just so we can actually uh, keep track of what we're talking about at this given moment. And we're going to look at all the eight possible adjacent nodes of Kerr node. Now, if Kerr node was up here, for example, where let's say Kerr node was right here, there isn't eight adjacent nodes. There's only one, two, three, four, Five. The ones above it don't exist, so they would not be. Ha they wouldn't. We would not have to look at them. If there was a wall in the way, for example, a wall right here, we wouldn't have to add those nodes either because they're not walkable nodes. They're not possible nodes that can be in our path. So what we need to do now is, given our current node, in this case 410, what are all the valid possible path nodes that are adjacent to it? So we have to look at these. Well, we get the first node. Well, that one's one row less and one column less. And we're going to add it to the open list. Now, let's not be too hasty here. We're not going to add it automatically. We have to go through a four-step rule process here. Well, I guess there's about three. Let's go back here. So for every node of the adjacent, every adjacent node of the current node, we're going to follow the following rules. A, ignore it if it's already in the closed list. Well, we don't have any other elements in the closed list, so it's not that one. B, if it's not in the open list, which is going to be the most common case, we're going to set its parent, which means where it comes from, to the current node. Now, let's think about that looking at the graphics for a second. So what we're saying is if we're going to add this guy, we're saying it comes from here. So our path originated at start and went to here. So this the S is this node's parent. Makes sense. We're saying, well, what was, what was the parent? Uh, where did I come from? 
So we're going to add it to the parent and we're going to recalculate its G cost, its H cost and its F cost. Well, F in our case is not going to change, sorry, H in our case is not going to change for that node because it hasn't moved and either has the N space. You'd only have to recalculate H if either it or end has moved. In this case, neither one's in, neither one's a problem here. The G cost, well, that's different. Remember, the G cost is dynamic. The G cost is, well, what is the cost of my parent? What is the G cost of my parent? So what is the G cost of the parent? Remember, we, we started out, we set the G cost to zero. We set the G of the start. We set start G equal to zero. That means the G cost of this one is the parent's G cost plus the cost to get from the parent to that new node, that adjacent node. Well, that's a diagonal movement, so that'd be a cost of 14. 14 plus zero gives it a G cost of 14. So it has a G of 14. Let me just kind of clear this out a little bit. There we go. So that means that this one's going to have a G cost of 14. Its H cost is the cost to get from across and down. So uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that means 8 times 10, it's going to have an H cost of 80, which means it has an F cost of 94. So we add that one. And now we do the exact same thing for all eight of the adjacent nodes, any one that's valid. And what's going to happen is we're going to find that we're going to have different F costs for each one of them, potentially different F costs for each one of them. And we're going to end up with these two looking pretty nice because of they're getting because their H cost is going to be pretty cheap because it's closer to E. So let's think about this. Let's look at this one down here. This one down here, uh, this node right here, what's its G cost? Well, the G cost of its parent, which is zero, plus the cost to get from the parent to itself, which is 14. So that means it has a G cost of 14. Well, that's not that great. What is its H cost? Well, H from here down to E. So we go across one, two, three, four. Four times 10, that means it has a, a uh, H cost of 40 which means it has an S cost of 54, or sorry, an F cost of 54. But what about the one above it? Well, that's a bit different. I'm getting cluttered up here. I apologize. I'm just going to draw an arrow to this one so we can figure what this is. So its G cost is the cost of its parent, which is zero, plus the cost to get from the parent to it. Well, that's a, a horizontal movement. So that's a G cost of 10. What is its, what is its H cost? Well, it's got to go across. One, two, three, four, five. So that has five times 10, which is 50. This has an F cost of 60. Well, that's less than 54, or sorry, that's greater than 54. So that means that the actual best movement in this case, the lowest F is gonna be the one down here in the diagonal, right here. So what is that location? That one is gonna be now, all these things are going to be added in here. So we have um, row th or sorry, column or row three, column nine, uh, row three, column column ten, row three, column eleven, sorry, eleven, and so on and so forth. All these things are going to be added on here. So we and then we're going to have row four, comma, column nine, four, eleven, because we don't put ourselves back in there. It doesn't make any sense. 5, uh, 9, 5, 10, and 5, 11. And what we're going to find on the next iteration through is that we're going to find that one of these ones has a better cost. So we just did that calculation. We added them all in. And going back through our, our chart here, once we've added them in, we look at, well, is the open list empty at this point? No, we just added eight elements to it. So it's definitely not empty. But if it were empty, that means that we're done. We don't have anything else to check, which means we didn't find a path. No good. No good at all. So that would mean we'd have to uh, end, return the fact that there was no path possible. However, if the open list still has elements to check, well, we continue our process. 
we go back up to the top of the open list and we start going through all the elements where did my stuff go? we start going through all the nodes in this list one at a time and repeating the process so what we're going to do is we're going to look at each one of these and find the best F cost out of all of them and what we would have found is that this one down here which is at row 5 column 11 has the best F cost of 54 so it's going to get removed from here and added into our close list now remember it has a parent of 4 comma 10 what's the parent of the starting node it doesn't have one it doesn't have a parent and this is important for later on so what we're going to do is we're going to find that as we go through this process um, our path is actually going to continue down and then across and then across because that diagonal with the closer H cost is going to come out better and better and eventually we're going to have uh, 511 added and then we're going to have then we're going to have added uh, row 612 and then 613 and then 614 and what we're going to find out is that oh ding 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 this is the end node going back to our algorithm oh my goodness where did it go there it is just not minimizing for me there we go sorry about that so we're going back to our algorithm where to go if the added node is the target node stop looping get out of the loop and then we come down here and we say hey if we found a path the target node is in the closed list this is how we do this let's go back basically every single one of these nodes that we've added to the closed list has a parent so for example we know that 511's parent was 410 612's parent was 511 and 613's parent was 613 trying to separate these so we can see this and 614's parent was 613 sorry that should be 12 down here 613 so how do we create our path well the path we do this in reverse order so the path oops the path say we start at the end node and the end node which is 6 comma 14 and we add that to the front of our list and then what we do is we look at the parent of that node and add it to the front of the list so after one step we'd have a we'd have our path which has 6 comma 13 and 6 comma 14 and we continue this process adding the parent each single time so then we'd have our path which is uh, where is it? 6, 12, 6, 13, and then 6, 14. Is this right? Did I miss one somewhere in there? 511, 6, 12, 6, 13, 6, 14. No, that's, that's right. And then we have 6, 14. You can see that each time the element is always being added to the front of the list. And the reason why we do that is because when it's all done, what we're going to have is the first element of the list is going to be the starting node which is 4 comma 10 how do we know that we're at the starting node how do we know that we're done our path because its parent is null it doesn't have a parent so it's going to have 4 10 and then 5 11 oops, 5 11 6 12 and then 6 13 and 6 14 and that's how that path is going to work just going to go through the process one at a time. That's 614. Now there's a lot written on here, and it's not the best handwriting, so please bear with me. So do you want to see an action? Let's see it in actual action. We have this path, and then it's up to you to figure out what you want to do with that path. Maybe you have a character start moving on it. Maybe it does nothing. Maybe it just highlights in the game. Who knows? It's up to you. It depends on the game itself. So let's take a look at a couple scenarios. I've created a couple different versions. Let's look at the ones that you've seen here and see how the path appears. So let me just open up some code for a second. Let me just minimize this. So looking at the f um, 
Where is it? Lost my code. There we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at that very f uh, the second scenario. We're not going to bother doing the one that doesn't have a wall because there's no real point to it. Um, it just goes in a straight line. However, if we wanted to look at the uh, second scenario where there's just a basic wall in the way, we can do that. Let me just I'm just commenting out some code so we can see everything. There we go. Now, if we run this program, we see the second scenario. Now, when I hit the space key, what's going to happen is you're going to see the path show up. And you can see that it went moved down on an angle first. Where's my maybe not gonna be able to see it? Moved down on an angle first, then down, down, down on an angle, up, and then up. Now we saw that. That's the scenario that we came across when we first discussed it um, a minute ago. I can make this disappear so you can see it again. And again, it just pops up. And that's the shortest path possible. Well, let's try another scenario. Let's look at one a little bit more complicated. Yeah, let's look at this one right here. This is the one where there was the potential problem of it moving towards the enemy immediately, the end zone immediately, and then having to loop back. But again, if we look at this, it does a perfectly straight line until it gets to the first short it can, shortcut it can take, which is that diagonal right at the corner piece. Great. I'm just going to turn on my mouse visibility so we can actually see the mouse here. Just give me one second. There we go. Alright, so that one didn't work out. Or, sorry, that one did work out, I should say. But let's look at the next one. The next one is a much more complicated one. This one actually takes terrain into consideration. So here, we have the option of swimming across the water or going across the road and then coming up and then moving around. Maybe it'll go across the mud, maybe it won't. So let's take a look. We see that it actually came down, traveled on the road, ignored the water completely because it was too expensive, then came up and went all the way around. Now you might be thinking, well, that's pretty obvious. Let's play with the numbers for a second. So. What I'm going to do is right now I have the water cost at six times the base cost and I have the mud cost at eight times. I'm going to reduce the water cost down to two times. So it's only twice as expensive as walking on standard ground. Oops. If we run this. Now if I do it, you can see that it actually chooses to go directly across the water. It's better for it to it's not as expensive as it was before so depending on the cost associated let's increase that to a three see if that changes anything we see that it's starting to make some different choices it's deciding well when should I go across that let's put it back to six let's make the mud super cheap let's make the mud only cost one we come across and run it again If we do this one, we see this time it says, hey, that mud's pretty cheap and the road's really cheap. So I'm going to go down, go across the road as much as possible because the road only costs half as much as a standard square. I'm going to take the hit on the mud, even though it's, uh, well, actually, in this case, we made the mud only cost one, or sorry, uh, equivalent, and then it works its way up around. We get different paths based on the terrain types. Well, how do we actually apply those terrain types? Where does it factor in? It factors in on our G cost. So whenever we're calculating our G cost, we still do it the same way. We say, well, what is the cost of my parent? Now add in the cost to get from my parent to myself. So we still have our horizontal and vertical. If it's horizontal, we say it costs 10. If it's vertical, it costs 10. If it's diagonal, it costs 14. But once you want to add the terrain type, all you have to do is multiply that by some type of scaling factor. So for example, if I say I want water to be six times as slow, let me just go back to this. If I want water to be six times as slow and I'm currently, uh, yeah. So I'm currently in this space here. 
I'm going to have to make a choice. Do I go across the water, go down or whatever? Whatever I, I choose to do. So what I'm saying is if I take my parents' cost, whatever that is, in this case it'd probably be uh, 14 here to get across to this diagonal. If I calculate that new cost, let's say I want to move directly across horizontally, that's a cost of 10 times the cost of the water, which is 6. So it would be actually an additional 60, not an additional 10. So it just factors in on the G cost. Now I'm going to show you some code. Um, there needs to be a few things that you need to realize going into this. Number one, you need to be familiar with two-dimensional arrays. You can go through this in our class material um, and uh, figure out all the things you need to know about it. The second thing you need to be familiar with is the idea of classes and objects. Now I'm going to do this in a separate video because I'm going to do one for the grade 11 class which is C sharp and one for the uh, grade 10 class which is Java. But they're both basically going to cover the same thing. The code is almost identical. Um, the difference is uh, how we do certain mechanics such as two dimensional arrays because they don't look the same in C sharp as they do in Java. But other than that the code is almost identical. So with that, we're going to end this 45-minute introductory video on pathfinding, and uh, we'll continue on after this with an actual code discussion.